Take your Bible and open it to the book of Micah, the book of Micah. Now, I have a couple of disclaimers this morning. Uh, the first is, if you hear me mention the book Malachi, that's because I'm having a senior moment, okay? <laughs> okay, we're talking about Micah, um, and um, just as a test, I have not marked it, so I have to try and find it myself too, okay? But Micah is toward the back of the Old Testament. Uh, the second disclaimer is that um, if my tie looks like it's not straight, it's Ray's fault. Because <laughs> he adjusted it for me after I got here, okay? You know, so, whatever. Micah chapter 6. Now, what I'm going to be talking about this morning was planted as a seed in my mind months and months ago. And it's just been kind of brewing around looking for a way to bust out. Uh, twice a week, I join with a bunch of old guys in, on a Zoom call. Uh, and there's about, uh, when, they're most of, when we're all there, there'd be 11 of us, you know, and believe it or not, I'm one of the younger ones, you know, so, so we're there. We're, we're talking about different things. We talk about everything, politics, theology, the Bible, family, sports, you know, just whatever it comes to mind, and we just go on and on and on. One day, we were talking about one of our favorite topics, uh, how things were going to the dogs, you know, how society's falling apart, everything's going downhill. And one of the guys, <clears throat> this plaintive voice out of one of those little boxes said, what can we do? Have you ever felt that way? We look at what's going on around us and, and, and we, we say, well, what can I do about it? You know, I, there are certain things I'm not going to do, but what could I do? Um, and I kept hearing it. And I saw that reflected here. If you're in Micah chapter 6, uh, I want to start reading verse 6, where it says, And what shall I, with what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? And I, I looked at that, and I think that's, that's kind of what I'm saying here. What can I do? What can I bring to God and say, see what I've done? See, what can I come and expect God to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, you know? And here, Micah is having this conversation, and it comes with an answer, which we'll get to when we get down to verse 8. But keep in mind that he is here talking to ancient Israel and giving a message that is still true for us today. Now, Micah was one of the minor prophets. Now, he wasn't called a minor prophet because he was unimportant. He was called a minor prophet because his book was short. If you notice, the big books in the prophecy are the first, and the, and the shorter ones are towards the end. So he's a minor prophet. And the first verse introduces the book. So turn to Micah chapter 1, and let's look at that first verse and just kind of get a feel for who this is we're talking to and what's going on. Micah chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord, which came to Micah of Moresheth, in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Micah was from this town called Morsheth. Now, that doesn't mean much to you, 
but it's about 26 miles southwest of Jerusalem. And if you want to get a feel for what that means, it, just when you leave here, when you step outside the door and you look over the sign down toward, you know, San Antonio, if we had a big catapult and we could put you on it and just launch you out there in that direction, so you flew 26 miles, you would land in the parking lot probably of Costco down there at 1604 and 281, right? Now, we're going to give you a parachute, so don't worry, okay? But, you know, and you would land there, and that would be about 26 miles. That's, that was the distance that Micah had to travel when he went from his hometown into Jerusalem. And if we were to take Micah and put him in that, if we could talk him into getting into the catapult, you know, I, I don't know how we do that, but being a prophet, he would probably know what's coming, you know, and launch him. As he flew over this area, he would look down and say, oh, man, that looks a lot like Israel, you know, up and down, hill country, you know, uh, the, the, from Jerusalem toward the coast, you have this, this kind of hill country, up and down, maybe a little higher, a little lower, but the same general feel. And I have this feeling, although I've never been there, the vegetation would be pretty similar too. Relatively dry, you know, some trees, a bit of rain here and there. But, but he would look down and say, oh man, this is just like home, you know, similar. And Micah, if he were sitting here with us today, listening, well, if he were sitting listening to our Zoom talk and all the griping we do, he'd say, man, I feel right at home, you know. What you're going through today sounds just like what I'm going through. Um, there's a lot of variety in leadership. If you look again there in verse 1, you notice there are three kings. Those three kings covered a time period of about um, 30 or 60 years. I'm sorry, 60 years. And one of the things about them is there was a lot of variety in who these kings were. Now, put your bulletin in. I'm going to cheat and put my bulletin in here because um, it's always a sad state of affairs when the guy who's preaching can't find the book he's preaching out of, okay? So I'm going to put mine in there, and I'm going to look at uh, 2 Kings, 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 15. And as you turn pages, you may notice that there are a lot of kings named through here. Uh, you know, what, what you have in First and 2 Kings is kind of a... Um, a list of what happened with the different kings in the northern and southern kingdom. Uh, now, I'm not going to ask you how many were paying attention in Sunday school years ago, but you remember that somewhere along the time, the northern and the southern kingdoms divided. Ten of the kingdoms went north and became Israel. Two of the king, or two, two, ten of the tribes went north and became Israel. Two of the tribes stayed in the south and they became Judah. Okay, so you've got this going back and forth here. And he would talk about this one became king in the third year, year of this one's reign and so forth, back and forth all the way through, okay? So that's what's going on here as we work through 2 Kings. Now look at chapter 15, and we're going to start, first of all, looking at Jotham and seeing some, some things that, were, that are normal, I guess. 2 Kings chapter 15, <clears throat> and I'm going to read starting at verse 34. And he, Jotham, did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He did according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Now, this is part of a pattern that you see through here. They're either doing what's good in the sight of the Lord, or they're doing what's bad in the sight of the Lord. And if you ever go through the kings in the north, every single one of the kings in Israel up in the north did bad in the sight of God. Okay, So they had this steady stream of, of desperados, of, of defiant, rebellious groups. In the south, it went back and forth. You had good, you had bad, you had good and bad. Now, uh, Jotham was listed as one of the good ones, but look at the next verse. Uh, only, in verse 35, only the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. He built the upper gate of the house of the Lord. So here's a guy who's kind of wishy-washy. Generally speaking, he's a good king. But he's not going to the wall to get rid of the pagan worship going on up in the hills. But then he turns around and he builds something for the temple. Okay, so back and forth, back and forth, kind of, you know, he's good, but not as good as he should be. Okay, and then we come down to Ahaz, chapter 16. I'm going to start reading in verse 2. 2 Kings, chapter 16, reading in verse 2. And you start to see similar pattern. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord his God, as his father David had done. So here we go. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's not doing what he's supposed to do. He is turning away from God. He's doing other things. Oh, and I forgot to mention, I'm going to be used, reading from the New American Standard translation. 
to me, the New American Standard is kind of like the King James is the pastor, you know. It's, it's the translation, okay. But, but I'll, I'll, I'll endure what you have, okay. But the New American Standard is what I'm using here, if, if it's different, okay. And so he turns away from his father, but it gets worse. Now, that would be bad enough. But here's where it gets worse, in verse 3. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. Remember, all the kings of Israel were turned away from God. Walked in the way of the kings of Israel. And he, uh, let's see, and even made his son pass through the fire according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had driven out from before the sons of Israel. Now, that's easy to read through, but I don't know if you understand what that's talking about. Have you ever seen, uh, have you heard of the god Moloch? Uh, the name comes up nowadays more and more often. But the god Moloch, the, the pagan god of the Canaanites. And the picture here is that Ahaz takes his firstborn child, goes down to the pagan temple where they have this huge statue of the bull with the, with the ears sticking up and the arms out like this. And that has been heated up till it's red hot. And he takes his child and... I don't know the procedure. Basically, he burns his child to death. And this was standard procedure in those days. But you know what? Micah would have felt right at home today with abortion on demand. You know, child pornography. Surgery on children so young they don't even know what sex is, let alone what sex they are. You know, you know he would have felt right at home with us today. See, see, things don't change as much as we sometimes think they do. So here we have this, this king throwing his, his child to death. Anyhow, then it goes on. We have kind of an interlude here. Now, Ahaz was bad enough, but Ahaz lived in a time where things were crazy politically all around him. Again, going back to your Sunday school lessons, you remember how Assyria came in, conquered the northern kingdom, and hauled everybody away into captivity, never to be heard from again? That happens when Ahaz is king. So Micah is in here talking about some pretty turbulent times, a lot of things going on over these 60 years. Um, you know, and so here he is, and then, well, if you look in chapter 17, verse 6. And in the ninth year of Hosea, that's a northern king, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and carried away Israel from exile, into exile in Assyria, and settled them in Halal and Habor and on the river Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. So, so they went away, never to be heard from again. Then we come to Hezekiah, the third king, chapter 18. Hezekiah, chapter 18, starting in verse 3. And he did right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places. Remember the first one we talked about didn't do that. He left them up there. He removed the high places. <clears throat> And the sacred pillars he cut down, and Asherah, he also broke the, in pieces the bronze serpent which Moses had made. Remember the, the serpent that Moses set up in the wilderness that they were supposed to, to look at to be healed? They now turned it into a superstitious idol. Uh, for until those days, the sons of Israel burned incense to it, and it was called Nahushish, not whatever. Okay. And then he, he trusted in the Lord, the Lord God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him among all kings. And then this last part really got me when I read it. It said, nor among those who were before him. He was better than David. This is probably the high point right here in the Jude Jewish um, leadership. So you have the worst king and the best king right next to each other. Now, I don't know particularly what your political persuasion is, but if you look at our leadership, you know, we tend to go back and forth and up and down and wishy-washy and, you know, we have all this, the same types of things going on here. It was a time of corruption. Look at Micah chapter 2. Let's go back to Micah now. Micah chapter 2 in verse 2, uh, talking about the leadership of, of Israel. They covet fields and then seize them, and houses and take them away. They rob a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. Now, does that remind you of uh, people losing their homes today with, you know, businesses being gone, lockdowns, all the kinds of things that are going on? Uh, you know, we they, they talk about coming in and taking your bank accounts. Yeah, there's all this kind of stuff. It's not new. It's been going on for a long, long time. And we live in a world like that. What we are going through is not unusual. So I come back to my question. What do we do? What do we do? Now, 
As I get into this a little more, I am not going to be focusing on our standard, uh, what you might call, guilt list. What are they, when people say, how are we going to change things, we, we, we go and we talk about, well, we're going to get involved in politics, we're going to get involved in uh, the moral issues of abortion homosexuality, we're going to, uh, we're going to go out and we're going to uh, uh, be concerned with the poor, we're going to have prayer and doing all this kind of stuff. Now here's the thing that I hope you understand. You're already doing that. You know, if it comes down to the basic things that churches and the people in the church are supposed to be doing, you get an A+. Plus, okay? So we don't need any guilt trips here. You know, we're, if, if you want to be involved, there are, every, somebody in this church can get you involved somewhere. There are places to be involved. It's all there. You know enough about that. But my question for me is, what can I do on a daily basis to make that difference? What can I do to change things? Now, on the internet, I came across this meme, and it went like this. Tip your server, return your shopping cart, pick up a piece of trash, hold the door for the person behind you, let someone into your lane, small acts can have a ripple effect. This is how we change the world. Now, that came from a non-believer. And he thinks by taking your grocery cart back, you're going to change the world. Now, I would admit that these are probably good things to do. I'm not, not, but, but if an unbeliever who is only confident in himself and the political world around us and all this kind of stuff can make a statement like that, how much more should we be able to embrace this idea that if we go out and do the small things, if we go out and do those little bits of righteousness that we're supposed to be doing, can we change our world? And my, to me, the answer is yes. We should believe it even more because we have a lot more influence than we feel because God takes our actions and he works through them. Now, I want you to understand the right questions coming from my heart. I'm not concerned about my salvation. I hope you aren't either, <laughs> you know. But I am concerned about being salt. I am concerned about being light. I am concerned about making a difference in my world as God would guide me. What can I do? So where do we start? Look with me at verse 8. Micah 6, 8. Am I in Micah? Yes, I am. Micah 6, 8. And he has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Three verbs there. And the first one is to do. To do justice. And that's pretty much what I'm going to focus on today, is this idea of doing justice. How do I do justice? I want to change the world. I want to be salt. I want to be light. How do I go out and do justice? I'm not a judge. I'm not a policeman. I have no official capacity anywhere. How am I going to do anything? And yet God here it requires that I do justice and that I make a difference. Now, that word do is such a simple little word. Uh, we use it all the time. Uh, it comes, you know, in fact... In the, New, in the Old Testament, it was used 2,636 times. Now, I have a confession to make. I did not personally consult each one of those, and I did not count them, okay? I'm just taking what it said there. 2,600 times this verb is used to do. And I think most of the time, it's probably just something simple like do your chores. Uh, guys, have you ever told your wife when she comes home, do laundry? Yeah, I didn't think you did. No, no. <laughs> Neither would I, okay. You know. But it's a simple command. You know, it's, it's kind of, you know, you might tell your kids, you know, whatever. But, or your wife might tell you. I don't know. Anyhow. Uh, do, okay. Very simple. But it's also an awesome word. Now, here, again, put your bullet in there. Don't get lost. And turn back to Genesis chapter 1. Because I want, I want you to see how this word can have power in it when it's magnified by the grace of God and the Holy Spirit Chapter 1 of Genesis, look at verse 7. 1 7. And God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. You say, well, that doesn't say do. No, it doesn't. It says God made, and that is our exact same Hebrew word. You might say that God did the expanse, okay? God did creation, okay? A simple little word, but backed by the power of God, is magnified and transformed and, and makes a big difference. Look down in verse 26, one other place there. It says in verse 26, And then God said, Let us make man in our image. The same Hebrew word, again translated make. 
That simple little idea of do justice. God says, I'm going to do man. I'm going to do creation. I'm going to do this because I'm going to have my power behind it. And God is using that word to us for our daily walk as we serve him. How many of you have to-do lists? I'm sure. You do. No, no, don't show hands. I, you know, I, you know, I know the women have them because right? they keep giving them to us. You know, uh, I have hundreds of to-do lists, and occasionally I find one. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Uh, you're digging through some and say, "Oh yeah, oh yeah, I did that." Oh no, you, you, you know what I mean? You know, the, the, we we put them someplace safe, which means so they won't bother us. You know, <laughs> safe. You know, we, we have these to-do lists. Uh, they're easy to ignore. But when God gives us a command and we try to ignore it, somehow it keeps sneaking under the door, around the corner, out of our pocket, out of the notebook, wherever you put that list. God keeps coming back and saying, yoo I said to do, I said do, I said get out there and get with this. This is a daily thing that we are supposed to be doing. God giving us a command to get busy doing justice. Now, this also brings up the question of what is justice? Uh, what is it we're supposed to be doing? It's not what you keep hearing. If you're old enough, you remember watching on TV crowds of angry protesters chanting, no justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. Now, that's what they're saying. What they really mean is, do it my way or I'll beat you up. Do it my way or I'll beat you up. Because that's pretty much what the world looks at when they say justice nowadays. You've all heard of social justice. Oh, Lord help us. There is no biblical justice in social justice. Because social justice is based on what particular political group you belong to, not to absolute truth. So if you hear someone talking about social justice, I want you to be polite, I want you to be courteous, and I want you to just ignore them if you can. You know, because social justice has nothing to do with what God is talking about here when he says, do justice. You may have heard of the Department of Justice. And what are we told? If the FBI shows up, shows up at your door, don't answer any questions. <laughs> you know, don't say anything. You, you, you know what I'm talking about. This, this is the way we feel about this idea of justice in our political system. Biblical justice is different. What we're supposed to be doing is totally different than this. Our justice is based on the character of God. Holy, righteous, omnipotent, all the omnis there. You know, when we talk about justice, it's not just something we pick here and there. It's something that is based on total, eternal, unchanging God. And that means it's based on unchanging truth. God's character is the foundation for unchanging truth. I, I'm sure you're aware of it. Your culture rejects the whole concept of unchanging truth. Truth is whatever works for you. I've read this in many t books that where they're defining the, the communist strategy and stuff. Uh, whatever advances my cause is true, and what works against me is not true. That's not the way it is for us. You see, we are serving a holy God, an unchanging God, an eternal God, who calls us to do justice. We are supposed to be working with un changing truth, which means it is founded in righteousness. And there's a little word that's getting worked around right now called morals, moral behavior. Uh, two sources of morality for us, the Ten Commandments. And can you think of one of those that is not broken in almost any TV program you watch? And then when Jesus was asked, what are the most important? He said, worship the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and your, and then your, and your neighbor is yourself. You know, those two things there. Those are pretty much set aside too. Biblical justice also demands something that we tend to forget. It demands impartiality. Impartiality. Now we're going to go to Leviticus here in a moment, so kind of keep that down there. But blind justice. Have you ever seen the Statue of Justice standing up there with a sword in one hand and a balance beam scale in the other? One of the kinds of scales that is the hardest to cheat on. <laughs> unless you put your finger underneath, you know, that kind of thing. But that's, that's why she's holding it up in the sword. And what is the other key aspect of justice? She's wearing a blindfold. Blind justice 
is a biblical concept because right and wrong don't change. And things are weighed in that kind of a balance. Modern justice talks about the rich being oppressors. And sometimes the rich are oppressors. That's true. You know, you can't get around it. But that is not what biblical justice means. Now look at Leviticus chapter 19. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, okay, Leviticus 19. I can find that because they're big books and they're all in the front, but Leviticus chapter 19. And look at verse 15. A lot of people have never seen this verse for some reason. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 15. You shall do no injustice. I think King James has something to do with righteousness there. In judgment, and you shall not be partial to the poor. Ooh, you shall not be partial to the poor. How unjust, you know. And, and, and nor defer to the great, but you are to judge your neighbor fairly. Now, the word judgment there is our word that we're supposed to be doing. Same Hebrew word. So when we are doing justice, we cannot take advantage of who we're dealing with. And these words here, uh, this is... The, you know, it's not a matter of social class. It's a matter of what's right and what's wrong. Now, two of the words here, the New, Amer New American Standard uses partial and defer. The King James has respect to a person and honor a person. And literally, it means to respect their face, to look at their face and respond to their face. You know, you, you're, you're counting people, persons. You're, you're, you're person conscious instead of truth conscious. That is the biblical concept of Justice. Now, the, the popular concept of justice is just the opposite. Uh, it's based on the current cultural trend. Just whatever is cool right now is whatever is just. Uh, this morning, I was looking through the news, and I saw a headline that said that now they are declaring that exercise programs are racist. What? I don't remember seeing that. You know, I, I must have skipped it. You know, uh, we have all these things. Whatever's the most current thing is, you know, it goes with it. Truth is relative. There is no such thing as absolute truth. They would, uh, if you go to a, a philosophy class or a college campus, you would have a hard time finding anybody on those campuses that would agree with you that truth is absolute and not totally relative. Now, obviously, some things are shades of gray. But there is still right and there is still wrong. There are certain things that do not change. Um, and then the morals. Morals based on popular opinion. Did you know that it is immoral to be pro-life and to try to save babies? But it's perfectly moral to save baby seals. Right? It is immoral to drive a gasoline car, gasoline engine, because, you know, they go in and they pollute the environment, pulling out that, ga that oil and stuff. But it's awesomely moral to drive a Tesla where they have children in slavery mining the cobalt and lithium. It's just out of your sight, you see. The, the sliding scale of what's right and what's wrong. Working hard is now immoral. It's part of that white head, you know, that, that whiteness thing, you know, working hard, showing up on time, all that kind of stuff. Student loans are okay, though, as long as they get forgiven. You know, we've got this sliding moral scale. But God is calling us to do justice, which means that when we go places, when we do things, we can't just float around and, and fluctuate and, and, and go along with whatever is going on around us. We can't do that. I mean, some of this stuff is, is did you know it's now considered racist to be colorblind? Think about that. Yeah, we're dealing with a bunch of crazy people, right? Say it, admit it. But you know what? We're not crazy. We may be, dis we may be disagreeable. We may be uh, not going along with, but, but our, our values and our standards are based on something that doesn't change. And we have to go with that. We have to, we have to cling to that. We have to understand that. Now, uh, we let it sink in. Now, what does that mean for us today? Do you ever have these moments of fantasy? I used to tell the kids at school, if I were king of California, the first thing I would do is do away with compulsory education. And they go, you don't want us to go to school? No, 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 that's not what I said. I said compulsory education. You know, that'd be the first thing I'd do. If I were king today, I wouldn't worry about California. They're pretty much, you know. You know. But if I were king, I would seriously wonder, 
Who am I going to impeach first? Who am I going to put on trial? Who gets fired? And I could get even worse than that, but we, you know, the FBI is probably listening, so we can't go with those. Numbers, so, you know. Now, it probably won't happen. In fact, I can guarantee it. <laughs> it, won't, it won't happen. But we need to, we can make a difference. We need to look around at the people we influence, the lives we touch, the ones that we might not even think about. They're all around us, and we need to begin doing justice with them. Now, I'm not giving you this lecture because I'm so good at it, okay? I'm not trying to say, man, I've got this down. I'm just saying, that's what the Bible's telling me. It says that God requires it. We have family. And you might think your kids don't listen. You might think your grandkids don't listen, but they do. And even more than that, they watch. They watch to see if you practice what you preach. Sunday school this morning, man. You know, I almost got up and started shouting in there because they, they were going to call. Uh, some of the things that were, they talked about how they talked to their grandchildren and they talked to their children, they talked to the young people. Uh, and they're sitting there talking about all these different people. They were doing justice for pity's sakes. They were taking the righteous values of God and they were verbally sharing them, if nothing else, with other people and reinforcing in their minds what is right and what is wrong, what is right and what is wrong. And if you count in the influence of the Holy Spirit, that becomes a very powerful message that we have. And then another thing that came up, there was a lot of things that went on in Sunday school, but another thing that came up was how they kept going back to, it's what the Bible says. It's what the Bible says. And we have to also keep coming back to that because that's what justice is based upon. Let me give you a current example, kind of current, I guess you would call it that. On Fridays, there's a group here that goes out to Stark's Cafe and has dinner, right? You know who you are. We'll get you later. And they invited me. And I walked in there the first time, and I walk in the door, and I'm looking around, kind of confused. And right away, the staff looked at me and said, you're looking for the Methodists, aren't you? <laughs> I don't know if it was my age, the confused look, what it was, you know, but, but they said, you're looking for them. They're back in the corner. Now, what that says is that entire staff at that restaurant knows who you are. They may not know where you live, but they know who you are. And Methodist has different meanings for different people, but it ties it somehow in that you are a part of this bunch of crazy people that go to church. Okay? <laughs> So I went back and I sat down and, and just watching uh, the waitress. The, and see, the waitress probably knows us better than anybody. And she still talks to us. It's cool. You know? <laughs> but, you know, they sit down and, 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 and they pray before the meal. She's not impressed. But then, <laughs> once, you want to join us? Oh, no, 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 no. Right away. Well, can we pray for you? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So they prayed for her, you know, and they, they kind of, they reached out to her as a human being. They were doing justice. They were taking the teachings of impartiality, of caring for your neighbor, of, of loving your neighbor, and they were reaching out and doing what they could in that atmosphere to reach that waitress. And then the thing that actually made this come home, because so far you can do that and it's no big deal, they leave good tips. I think. I mean, you know, I don't go around and count it, you know, but, but, but I see them consciously trying to leave good tips. And that probably seals it more than anything else because there are waitresses there that could tell you stories about people who pray over their meals and who witness to them and are snottier and all get out and never leave a tip. You know what I'm talking about? Because doing justice is, involves all of that stuff. And, and so they're out there, they're doing justice right here in Stark's Cafe. Right, you know, justice is being done right here, okay? Think about the people you touch. Every day, every week, every month, I'm, I'm going to go through my list. You may have a different list. But, but, uh, and again, I'm not saying I do it well, but we all have these people we touch. Every one of us, I hope, has someone who cuts our hair. Some of you on my question, I don't know. But, you know, someone who does our hair. And I have developed this conversation. And, you know, I, I'm a kind of guy, I can go and sit down in the barber chair and veg out until we're done. Okay, that, that's me. I, I am an introvert. I don't need to talk to people. But what I've had to do is, if I'm going to do justice, I have to reach down inside of me and kind of click that switch over to extrovert. 
you know, and, and, I, and I start talking, I start interacting, I start, you know, anytime I go with people, I have to kind of reach down. At school, when I used to go to school, if you saw me pulling into the parking lot, you see me getting out of the car, and I turn around and start across the campus, <laughs> hi, kids, how you doing? You know, it, 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 it's something we need to work on if we're going to do justice. There are times to kind of hide in your room and read your book and, you know, whatever. But there are times where we have to get out and get them. So I talked to her about different things. We, we, I loaned her a, bio, a study Bible for a while so she could look some things up. We talk about all kinds of things. Went to the dentist. I talked to a hygienist, a den, a, the dentist herself, the office staff. And I'm sitting here talking to the lady about my bill, and some lady clear across the, the room looks up from her computer and says, oh, tell your wife thanks for the, for the vanilla. Now, I have learned that when people say stuff like that, I just say, you're welcome. See, what that meant is my wife got there before I did. And she likes to take cookies and do stuff. You know, I don't know how many times in my life I walked in and they said, oh, thanks for this thing. I have no idea what they're talking about, but I just thank them and assume my wife got there first, okay? And, and, and we, we have these things, these people we touch. How many doctors? <laughs> how many doctors have you talked to? You know? And um, how many seeds have you planted? Are you doing justice on a regular basis? And one of the things that gets me, see, I usually sit back in the corner over here where, where my family is, you know. And one of the things that gets me about this congregation, I sit back there and I watch. And I see a whole bunch of marriages that seem to be working really good. <laughs> you know? There are all kinds of little secret things you guys do. You may not even know if anybody's watching. You may not even be aware of them. But little things that you say, God has given me a good one here. You know, little things like that. And I'm almost convinced that if we could take that and clone it into every church in this country and have marriages filling the churches of our country like that, we wouldn't need to have another election. We wouldn't need to replace judges. We wouldn't need to impeach anybody. We wouldn't need anything. Because this country would be transformed if people would simply do justice in those simple, everyday, common, ordinary things of life. So what am I to do? Micah 6, 8 again. He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. That begins the minute we dismiss and start walking out that door. See, we can do justice by holding up biblical standards and applying those biblical standards in our life everywhere we go. Now, we are going to be the odd man out many times. We're going to be the freaks. We're going to be the weirdos. That's okay. You're doing justice because you are lifting up the standards of God in your daily life. We have a lot of people to influence. I don't know about you, but I want to change the world. Yeah. Unfortunately, I just want to do the big stuff. <laughs> you know, but in my heart, I know I can't do the big stuff. So I have to be satisfied with doing what God told me to do, which is the little stuff. Um, God has required that I do justice. I want to obey. So I am resolved to let him work through me, focusing on the small stuff. Now, we just came through Thanksgiving and Christmas. I don't know how many of you, you, you men and, and children understand, but that Christmas dinner does not just appear on the table. Oh, some of that stuff starts months ahead of time, you know, weeks ahead of time. You know, ironing and, and polishing the silver or wiping off the plastic, whatever you use in your house, you know. <laughs> you know, either getting out the paper plates or washing the old plate. You know, we do all the things, and then you get into the cooking part. Whoa. Now, for the record, I peeled the potatoes, okay? Just, just so you know, okay. But I didn't worry about it because I trusted that my wife would make the big things happen. That's what she does so well. And you know, I am going to trust God to make the big things happen. Because I'm going to be faithful in the small things as much as I can. And I'm going to do justice in my world and the people I contact. And I'm going to let him worry about the big issues because he is God and he is in charge. That first question again in Micah, in chapter 6, verse 6. With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? And then verse 8. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? 
You know, we've already been worshiping, singing about this. We've been drinking coffee, eating cookies, doing all kinds of things as we worshiped here. We sung about being resolved. We sung about being trusting, obeying. And we're going to finish by singing a song, I'll live for him who died for me.